Section 2 of The Progressive Woman, Volume 7, Number 75, October 1913. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Principles of Mental Hygiene Applied to Management of Children by Dr. Luellis F. Barker. One fact which has become ever clearer as medical knowledge has advanced concerns the nutrition of the child. Faulty feeding in infancy and early childhood may lead to such impoverishment of the tissues and such stunting of growth that the ill effects can never be recovered from in later life. A considerable proportion of the intellectual and moral inferiorities among our people is fairly attributable to imperfect nutrition at this early age. Fortunately, the public is now being so thoroughly educated to the importance of breastfeeding for infants and of liberal and suitable diet during the early years of life by family physicians on the care and feeding of children that it is not necessary to dwell at length upon the subject. Plenty of good simple food, including milk, vegetables, and fruit, with avoidance of condiments, coffee, tea, and alcohol, is approved by all authorities. Many parents make the mistake of allowing the caprice of the child to influence its diet. We now know the foods that are suitable for children, and knowing these, the children should be provided with them in suitable amounts, and should be required to eat of them, largely independent of choice. The child that learns to eat and digest all the wholesome foods, and who is not permitted to cultivate little food antipathies, makes a good start, and avoids one of the worst pitfalls of life with which medical men are very familiar, namely a finical anxiety concerning the effects of various foods, all too likely to develop into a hypochondriacal state. There is a greater recognition now than formerly also of the fact that children should not be too tenderly brought up, that a certain amount of judicious hardening of the body is desirable. While fattest and extremists in this direction fall into grievous errors, making their children go barefoot and bare-legged in the snow, and compelling the feeble non-reacting child to take plunges in ice-cold water, a still greater mistake is made by those who overprotect their children and who fail to accustom their bodies early to cool baths and to exercise in all sorts of weather. The child who is brought up in such a way that he is very sensitive to slight changes in temperature is bound to suffer from it sooner or later, and everyone is familiar with those who grumble at the weather. If children can be suitably dressed and are early accustomed to taking a cool bath in the morning, and to walks out of doors every day, rain or shine, and whether it be cold or warm, the skin and nervous system quickly acquire a tolerance for variations in temperature most desirable for health and for the feeling of well-being. An out-of-door life for children also leads them unconsciously to exercise their muscles more than is possible for the child who stays indoors. Not only physicians, but also laymen from the old Greek times to the present, have been impressed with the importance of bodily exercise and harmonious muscular development for the welfare of the mind and of the nervous system. If we wish our children to be strong, energetic, and courageous, if we desire to ensure them against the nervous ills which follow in the wake of debility, inertia, and timidity, we must see to it that all the muscles of their bodies are systematically and regularly exercised. For this purpose, the plays of children are very important and the only child, deprived of the companionship of brothers and sisters, unless pains are taken to supply other playmates for him, is much to be pitied. Besides, play, walking, running, rowing, riding, swimming, paddling, and sailing are all desirable forms of bodily exercise. In the cities, and especially during the school year, systematic gymnastic exercises, calisthenics, have to be resorted to, and where no suitable gymnastic exercises can be obtained, parents will do well to teach older children some forms of exercise to be taken in the early morning. In addition to the hardening of the body, the education of the child should include measures which increase the resistance of the child against pain and discomforts of various sorts. Every child, therefore, should undergo a gradual process of psychic hardening and be taught to bear with equanimity the pain and discomfort to which everyone sooner or later cannot help but be exposed. What I have said about clothing, cold baths, walking in all weather and at all temperatures, play and exercise in the open air, has a bearing on this point, 
for a child who has formed good habits in these various directions will have learned many lessons in the stealing of his mind to bear pain and to ignore small discomforts. Physicians who work among nervous cases realize how often the child who has been too much protected from pain becomes the victim of nervous breakdown later in life. I've seen many a woman who could bear great sorrow or suffer without flinching the pain of childbirth, who still had no tolerance for the little ills of life. In such cases it is the idea rather than the sensation from which the patient suffers, and such abnormal ideas most frequently arise in those who have not learned in childhood to bear pain well or to adjust themselves without complaint to the disagreeable sensations and experiences which are essential to a normal bringing up. End of section 2